this week on Quadriga, World Wide Web, free internet in danger? Could a United Nations agency soon start running cyberspace? Fears have been raised that could be the result of a meeting of the International Telecommunications Union now being held in Dubai. China, Russia and other countries believe governments should have more rights to manage technical aspects of the net. But campaigners are worried that could lead to a diminished role for the independent bodies which perform these functions now. Is there a chance governments could put an end to freedom on the internet? Your host this week, Melinda Crane. Hello and welcome. About 150 nations are gathered in Dubai to renegotiate international telecommunications rules that were last updated in 1988, before the World Wide Web, before the mobile phone. Could the result of the meeting limit our access to online information? Some big web players have talked about this unleashing World War 3.0. Sounds like hype, or is it a real risk? That's what we want to talk about today with three experts who have been following events in and around the Internet. Marcus Beckedahl has, since 2002, been blogging about politics in a digital society at netzpolitik.org. That's an award-winning blog that's widely read in the German-speaking net. He also serves as an expert to the German Parliament's Commission on Internet and Digital Society. Sergei Sumleny is a Russian journalist who reports from Germany for the business journal Expat. He's a former producer in the German network ARD's Moscow Bureau, and he also served as editor-in-chief of the RBC Network's World Business News. And Philipp Holtmann is an expert on the Middle East and the Islamic world at the University of Vienna. He has reported freelance from Israel and Jordan, and he also worked with the German Institute for International and Security Affairs on a research project entitled Internet Jihadism. Marcus Begadal, is there really so much to worry about with this ITU uh, renegotiation? After all, it's been 24 years since the structure, since the rules were last updated. The world's changed a lot in that time. Uh, isn't it time to take another look at that treaty? Yeah, of course, it is time to take a new look into the Treaty of the International Telecommunication Union. It's one of the oldest organizations we have on a global level. It uh, started in the 1860s uh, to do some standardization on telegraphic um, technology, a technology we just know from the history books. And now they are debating uh, whether they should get some more control over the Internet. And this might be a risk, um, but on the other side, it might be just a hype. Yeah, exactly. I mean, is there really any way that a 147-year-old organization like the ITU is in any position to take over the World Wide Web? Yeah, the ITU has a problem. She's old and she was responsible or is responsible for telephone, uh, telephone infrastructures. But in the last 20, 30 years, a lot of our communication infrastructure um, changed or switched from the telephone um, infrastructure to the Internet. And now the ITU wants to have a new role. Um, they want um, to, um, to get older. Uh, and there are in other words, of, an organization looking for a mission. Yeah, they are looking for a mission since 10 years. And um, now we have a debate we started 10 years ago, whether the ITU should get some more control over the Internet, which is now being controlled by multi-stakeholder bodies like the ICANN or the, Internet, um, the I, uh, ETF, the Internet uh, Task Force. <laughs> the fact that even our absolute web expert isn't quite sure what those initials stand for actually shows just how unregulated the Internet has been recently. Philip Holtman, when you look at this, um, and we ask ourselves the question, if there were going to be more regulation, isn't it better to have it in the hands of a UN body like the ITU than perhaps left up to the private sector? It's a good question. Um because indeed I think there's a danger that the power, or at least the um, dominion over digital culture and how people behave and how people perceive 
themselves through the net and are also influenced uh, by this in their offline and daily behavior, that this power is going to rest in the hands of the corporations and the capital. But on the other hand, as many of us Westerners are really aware, um, the United Nations bodies are not really perceived as objective, world justice giving bodies throughout the world. There are many countries who, per uh, who perceive them merely as uh, uh, puppet body bodies for the politics of the United States and their allies. And so uh, I think we should wait uh, uh, with uh, uh, giving any more power to UN bodies and uh, see what the exact um, role of such bodies could be. We're going to talk about in a minute about some of the arguments that are made for expanding international control, but I'd like to get Sergei Sumleny's opinion on whether this is more about hype or whether you see a real risk of an expanding and limiting control of the Internet. I see a great risk in all these attempts to uh, get control over internet. I cannot agree at all with the idea that uh, capital-controlled internet is a danger for something and only good state control can improve the situation, maybe even save it. When we speak about state control that could be a good a position to a good alternative to a bad corporation control like evil Google, evil Facebook, evil Apple or something like that. Uh, just think about what state you, you, are, you are speaking. Uh, you are speaking about China uh, where hundreds of people are executed every year, where you don't have any freedom of speeches, freedom of demonstrations, freedom. you don't have freedoms in China. And now you said that uh, Facebook is that evil that endangers uh, the, the, the freedom of internet and we have to call China to improve the situation. That is something strange for me, this opinion, really. And when we speak about the United Nations control over internet and if it could be a hype, I really don't think that we need to repair something that is working now. And if the, the, the internet is a highly complex, it's not community, it's a world. It's a high, highly complex world that is really good governed now. And as uh, Mr. Beckerdahl has uh, uh, said, well, we have two organizations that have uh, complicated names. Uh, even we don't know exactly what, uh, what their names are, but it works. You just open your iPhone, your smartphone, and it works. And why should we call states that are famous for their attempts to control and to ruin everything that they take in their hands to involve in the world that works perfectly or almost perfectly? The fact is, Marcus Begadal, as I understand it, at this World Conference in Dubai, which has the name World Conference on international telecommunications, the main players, the main participants are nation states rather than private internet bodies or NGOs. Is that right? Yeah, it's a UN organization. So uh, the only entities who can vote on something are states, are the diplomats. Um, but uh, companies um, can get access by paying a very high fee, but they get access without having a vote. Uh -huh. So does that indicate that Sergei's concerns about states like China, like Russia, having a disproportionate influence on the outcome of this conference, that that concern would be justified? Yeah, of course. Um, we have two main blocks within this debate. Uh, the one, uh, the, yeah, one block is the Western world around the United States, around the European Union and the Allies. They want to, um, yeah, um, to stay on the established system. What? brought us the internet and uh, what brought us a big uh, open ecosystem with lots of innovations in the last uh, 10, 20 years. On the other side, we have um, um, the big repressive regimes like Russia, like China, like the Iran or Saudi Arabia. They want to get more control over the internet. They want to establish their national internet. Uh, they want Indeed, to... Indeed, Iran has already done that, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, Russia gotten... is working on it. So you have several proposals, um, for uh, example, from Russia and Egypt. Um, they want to have new solutions against uh, spam.
So everyone would say spam, it's a good thing. We have lots of spam in our email boxes. We should find a solution. But if you take a look how they define spam, then you find out, oh, they mean uh, protests, um, um, mails, protests, SMS, text messages uh, for organizing demonstrations. That's what they define as spam. It's not uh, something what I would uh, define as spam, but these countries like Egypt and Russia, they saw they have some problems that people are using SMS text messages to organize protests against the government. And they want to have solutions to be able to block everything around um, um, yeah, such uh, events where people demand freedom of expression in their countries. So uh, clearly security consistency consideration sometimes used as a pretext. On the other hand, Philip Holtman, you did research in this area. The fact that the internet at the moment is kind of a wild west open frontier does create a lot of dark spaces where, for instance, cybercrime and terrorism can flourish, doesn't it? Yes, that's true. Every communication space, every society create such spaces through subcultures, th through people who do not agree, uh, sects, um, terrorist groups, um, extremists, environmental extremists and so on. And uh, one of the biggest uh, terrorist actors uh, traditionally has been the state itself. So there's always a lot of um, uh, space for terrorism also on the internet, that's right. And how do we distinguish legitimate security considerations and legitimate needs for control of those dark spaces from illegitimate regulation of the kind that Marcus Beckedahl talked about? I think legitimate restrictions on the flow of information are very important where, where we can discern real dangers um, that may face citizens or uh, opinion leaders of our societies going to be targeted for their policies or for their um, assumed uh, faults uh, by the hands of terrorists or extremists. On the other hand, uh, the security discourse is a very, very difficult and blurry issue in a very blurry business because uh, counter-terrorism, terrorism, especially on the internet and digital culture, both discourses uh, feed on each other, need each other to watch each other, quote each other, to uh, have each other in order to exist. And uh, this is something uh, structural which not only concerns the digital space but also the physical space and institutions of state or of a physical terrorist organizations so that the so-called security people need the so-called terrorist people. And who stands in the middle is the citizens. And uh, they basically stand at the receiving end of the line. That's something we should talk about. And let's indeed talk about it after taking a quick look at the way that repressive regimes have used the internet to squeeze exactly the kind of citizens that Philip Holdman's talking about. In many countries with oppressive regimes, the Internet is one of the most important tools for critics of the authorities. Cyberspace is hard to control, but that doesn't stop governments from trying to clamp down. Reporters Without Borders has named countries such as Uzbekistan, China and Iran as enemies of the Internet. China's so-called Great Firewall ensures that search engines don't pull up critical websites when terms like Tibet are entered. Governments in Egypt, Libya and Bahrain all blocked access to the Internet during the Arab Spring uprisings. That was important because protesters relied on online means to communicate with each other and with the outside world. The Cuban regime controls online access in another way. Connection speeds are often so slow that the information flow is almost completely stopped. Sergei Sumlani, 
tell us something about Russia's position in all of this. Marcus Bekadal mentioned Russia itself wanting to set up a national internet, which seems like a contradiction in terms. And at the treaty conference at the moment, it's asked for a new provision in the treaty to allow governments to shut down internet access whenever someone in their territory uses the web to, quote, interfere in the internal affairs of that country. Purely illegitimate attempt to censor, or is there some legitimate concern there? Well, with uh, the proposals of Russia that were rejected uh, in later days, were criticized by the United States and even by Google, for example, from private side, they would uh, completely legitimate it because their proposals of Russian side uh, from the Ministry of Communication of Russia say that uh, every country has a sovereign right to control internet within its borders and that means to define what is legitimate in internet um, to give access or to deny access to internet etc etc so if russian proposals would be accepted by international community that would be completely legitimate what does russia want uh, russian authorities are really afraid of internet of uncontrolled internet. They say, well, we'll create our own internet sector. There is no speech about creating Russian net or Russian internet, but Russian internet sector. Um, there are some symbolic acts they have taken last months and years, for example, since once, since one year, uh, I think it is, yeah, since once year, you can type mostly uh, names of sites with Cyrillic letters uh, that sounds great uh, nobody thinks about uh, the fact that the Cyrillic letters are later translated into complicated groups of latin letters but it looks great when you uh, type not moscow.com but moskva.com in russia in russian but the most important thing is that in later weeks and later months Russia has passed very strict legislation that allows government and police and up to very low level of policemen and courts to shut down internet sites if they endanger the, uh, uh, the sciotic mood of children. And that means if you have on Wikipedia, for example, an article about suicide, and uh, there is a scientific explanation what does suicide mean what uh, several uh, what different cultures and religions think about suicide uh, what how was suicide descriptive uh, in literature etc from shakespeare to let me say modern films they say well suicide is a very dangerous thing uh, if a child would read it he could be endangered he may try to to commit suicide in the worst case. That's why, why not to shut down Wikipedia? And uh, there was an attempt, for example, to shut down the whole YouTube.com site because of one bad spot. There were attempts of local authorities to shut down, for example, some block platforms because of one block, and these block platforms were shut down in some big cities with a population of over 600,000 people. And that is really very dangerous situation. When a local authority says, that is bad, we shut down. And then in six months, you can go to court. OK, there are a couple of considerations here. I'd like to leave aside for the moment the question of typing things in in the language of the country you're in, because that takes us into some national issues that are also quite interesting in terms of who dominates the system through language, through other uh, aspects. But let's take that in a minute. Let's focus now again on this issue of security and of often legitimate national demands for some control, at least, of what's happening in a public space. Marcus Bechdel, how do we balance those two things? Real fears about abuse of the internet for terrorism, for cybercrime, weighed against nation states' repressive aspirations. Yeah, Philip, I um, mentioned before that open societies always have the situation that there are some subcultures we can't really control. Even in repressive regimes, you will find subcultures, for example, um, yeah, people who speak out their opinion 
it is a subculture in their opinion, um, um, who are uh, out of control. The question is how do we regulate it and how uh, or if, um, no, whether we use technology to try to control it, um, that's a big problem. For example, in Russia or in China, there are lots of people, for example, China people who um, speak out uh, for Tibet. They are called terrorists in China, but uh, in Europe they are called heroes. Um, we support them with technology, we support them with training, so they are able to speak out and uh, use their human right of freedom of expression to speak out. But how do we find a balance? That's a big question. We are even not able to find a balance with the United States uh, about um, hate speech, about uh, Holocaust lie, which is forbidden in Germany. And I think it's good that it's forbidden, but in the United States um, you are free to, uh, to use this lie that there was no Holocaust. Philip Holtmann, even if we could come up with a perfect liberal free internet treaty here, even if the ITU negotiations resulted in something of that kind that would guarantee some kind of freedom of speech and actually subject all ITU member states to certain requirements, countries really abide by that? Isn't the fact that they are going to, at least repressive regimes, shut down the internet no matter what's written in an international treaty if they can view it as threatening to their interests? You're absolutely right. Of course, countries um, who have different strategic interests than those stipulated by ITU agreements would not abide by these agreements simply for the reason that ITU is a UN body and it is not only about repressive small failed or rogue states who would probably act like that but uh, the superpowers are just uh, exercising this model uh, for emulation for any other smaller state namely to accept those rules of UN bodies who are just uh, fitting into strategic interest and to ignore uh, others um, which are um, against those interests and so uh, the ITU probably will um, suffer from uh, uh, similar uh, difficulties. Indeed, Sergei uh, Somlany, one of the objections that has been made by many smaller countries, emerging economies, but also by countries like Russia is, hey look, this whole internet system until now reflects the early U.S. predominance in this area, the fact that the internet was initially set up by U.S. organizations, including the U.S. Army, and we want to say in how the whole thing works. That is legitimate, isn't it? Um, that is legitimate, of course, and uh, don't forget there are many uh, very active Russian internet companies that are very successful. If you look at, for example, at the search engine Yandex, that is the most popular search engine in Kyrillic uh, speaking countries, not only in Russia, in the Ukraine, in, in other uh, countries of former Soviet Union, Yandex is expanding in Turkey. Nobody knows in Turkey that, that Yandex is a Russian company. But if you open maps in Istanbul, you don't use Google Maps, you use Yandex Maps. There are lots of Russian internet companies uh, and IT companies. Think of Kaspersky. It's a Russian company, Russian origin company. Think about some others uh, like, 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 like Abbey uh, that try you to, 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 to digitalize text. Russian IT companies are successful without any support from the state. And for Russia, of course, it is a very important topic for Russian authorities that internet is US based or US origin uh, but it's not economic uh, it's not economic problem it's a pure political problem when Russian authorities symbolic in other words exactly uh, and it's very useful in r internal Russian political debates as soon as some oppositional leaders publish something on YouTube uh, then uh, some authority person would say, well, it is the information that comes from outside, from US-based company. You cannot believe everything that, that is published on a server that is based in California, because it's probably anti-Russian. That is what it's all about. They don't need to get more money from Internet. They want to say, well, if the server is located in Russia, if we can to shut down at any time, 
will get the same great situation like in China. Markus Beckedahl, this issue of predominance by the, of the U.S. in the Internet system, are there some real objections to be made there? I know that the ICANN, which is the organization that watches over domains and essentially allocates domain names, they've been trying to expand other languages and other cultural areas uh, reflection in the system, so to speak, in order to get around some of those concerns. But the fact is, ICANN remains a U.S.-based organization. Yes, it's a big problem, but I... I'm, uh, I believe it's a, a smaller problem than bringing all these debates to the ITU. Because the ICANN is a US-based organization, but it uh, has a multi-stakeholder approach. So civil society and business and governments come together to debate topics and to try to find a solution. There are lots of um, um, ways how we can reform ICANN. I think we have to start a debate um, whether uh, we can get it out of c control of the uh, U.S. government, maybe by bringing ICANN to Geneva, where the United Nations um, have their headquarters. Is that seriously been talked being talked about? Um, there are um, th these demands, but it's not a big debate. But um, I think ICANN is way much better, and uh, the last 20 years showed it, than ITU. Because the ITU is not a multi-stakeholder approach. The ITU is one of the biggest, uh, less transparent, less participate uh, organizations. It's, uh, uh, it has more uh, um, yeah, a, a charm or... Um, it has more the feeling like a 19th century organization and not a 21st century organization. Uh, when you can go to ICANN, you have lots of uh, technology experts debating about standards and how we find uh, solutions for all the technology questions around the Internet. If you go to the ITU, you have diplomats who have no clue about uh, telecommunication, uh, no clue about uh, technology and Internet. They just um, do horse trading behind closed doors. So uh, they, um, uh, they change uh, Agrar um, subvention, so oh, uh, <laughs> agricultural yeah, subsidies. Yeah, yeah. They, they exchange agriculture subsidies against internet freedom, and they try to build their blocks uh, to uh, to win a majority. And don't forget, uh, there are lots of diplomats who have never written something in internet. They have. Uh, maybe there, there are some Western diplomats use this, and I'm sure most of them do. But if you look, for example, on Russian foreign ministry, there was a scandal two or three months ago as a group of hiring diplomats have published uh, an open letter to uh, foreign minister Lavrov. And there were persons who probably uh, were, uh, were, were, were high-ranked diplomats like, like, like ambassadors, etc., high-level diplomats, that uh, accused Lavrov uh, for buying computers for them. They said, oh, why do we need computers if we need to, to, to type something? We go to secretary and she types it. Okay, true. But by that argument, no. diplomats couldn't be negotiating the end to war because they haven't borne arms. I think, you know, that <laughs> <laughs> perhaps, perhaps we can slightly discount that argument. But you have both raised one very legitimate point that perhaps we can uh, talk about in a bit more detail, namely the idea of who's set to make money from the Internet going forward now. Clearly, we have more traffic than we have ever had before. And in many ways, isn't the real discussion in Dubai perhaps less about censorship and less about the freedom of the Internet for information than the freedom to make money, Philip Holtman? Well, I guess from, from a cooperative side or perspective, you need a free flow of information, and not restriction, in order to guide... Uh, 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 consumption behavior, let's say uh, the way consumption behavior was constructed since the 1970s, 80s through uh, Stanford Research Institute's uh, psychological values program, um, influenced uh, marketing and media campaigns heavily in the age of the, uh, satellite TV. And Ronald Reagan in 1980 announced, I'm going to uh, uh, unleash government and let you do what you do so good, let you govern. He was basically uh, 
um, referring to one of these marketing concepts which had been developed by SRI and which almost has been totally forgotten until today, but mainly all modern managerial or marketing approaches which um, function in the internet in order to steer people buying things they don't really need in order to gain consumption or salvation are based on this concept. So, of course, for the corporations and for the uh, uh, digitally administered corporational capital, the free flow of information is much more efficient and better than any kind of uh, governance or regulation. And I think this is what we are going to see, that we have um, a relatively high level of uh, participative power and possibilities as users in the internet, uh, but the stimulus and the agendas will be mainly governed by the markets and by the corporations. And this is an equilibrium which is acceptable, maybe, but um, definitely we will have not a centralized or regula regulated uh, government of the internet in the near future. Marcus Beckerdahl, won't we need to have some kind of regulation or channeling of the flow of information in the future? The servers, providers are saying, look, with this increasing volume, with this massive increase in traffic, we can no longer guarantee completely free flow of information. We are going to have to charge users. Big users will have to pay more than smaller ones. Is that a legitimate concern? Mm -hmm. And is this something that the ITU needs to be looking at? Yes, some providers <coughs> say it. Um, we have the big uh, telecommunication companies like the Deutsche Telekom in Germany who are arguing they invest in their infrastructures, but um, most of the money is being earned by big companies like Google and YouTube who, uh, or Facebook who don't have their own infrastructures. And now, we are with these arguments uh, in between the net neutrality debate. It's about uh, whether we um, establish such a system of charging um, money from um, content providers for being transported through networks. And there's a, techno a technological um, argument against it. That's too complex. The internet is not only one network. The internet is a huge network uh, of thousands and over more thousands of networks and you need to establish um, at the uh, frontiers between two networks it's a nodes a, a system to be able to um, to dig into the um, uh, to into the data stream in real time and uh, this is a very bad thing and it's nearly impossible to be able to charge um, all the money. And there's an um, economical argument against it. Um, big companies like Google and Facebook, they could, uh, can pay this money. But if they have to pay, they want uh, faster lanes to come with their content to us. And if they get faster lanes, then we have a problem. Others who are not able to pay for it, um, the more the new innovative startups, my blog or every of our websites, we are, will be transported on uh, very slow lanes and um, uh, we have a disadvantage but, against the big companies. But why should the internet work differently than the physical infrastructure in the non-digital world? As we know very well, you get what you pay for. If you don't pay for upgrading infrastructure, as we mm -hmm. could recently see in the US during mm -hmm. Storm Sandy, then you have outmoded infrastructure that doesn't work and can't bear the traffic. Why should the internet be any different? Yeah, in this case, it's um, as a economics uh, um, say it's a double market, what the telecommunication uh, companies want. They want to charge money from both sides um, uh, of the spectrum, from the users on the one side and from the people who put content on the internet. Uh, they want to change the whole system, how the internet works, back to the system of the telephone uh, age, uh, where the people who call other people pay for it. And it's a, uh, this is a paradigm change. You have to change all the technology. And now we come back to the ITU. The uh, European technolo um, um, telecommunication companies um, put a proposal to the ITU to um, establish such a system. 
and the only allies they found were Saudi Arabia, Russia, Iran and all the other uh, repressive regimes because they found out that it's a very good idea to dig into the data streams in real time to take a look, oh, there's something coming from the United States writing about uh, Dalai Lama, oh, we, um, it's... Uh, we filter it out. Yeah, we filter it out. Because it's and dangerous for our children. Yeah, and so... Um, the proposal of the European telecommunications um, companies, they are, the, um, from a technology view, the best uh, things uh, repressive regimes uh, want to have to establish a better control and censorship infrastructure. Sergei Sumlani, uh, with your business background, how concerned are you that increased intergovernmental regulation of the Internet through this ITU system or otherwise could deter investment and raise the costs for all of us who are consumers? Well, as I uh, already told, uh, I don't uh, like ideas to repair or even rebuild something that already works. <laughs> And I absolutely agree with Mr. Beckedal. Um, if the, the, the providers say, well, uh, uh, they need to, pay, uh, the, 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 the persons who put something in the internet need to pay for downloads, that is really unfair, absolutely. First, I pay some 20, 30, 50 euro a month to download something as a user. And then the person which content I download should pay more. And just imagine, okay, it's an evil idea, but. As an oppositional uh, politician, I put some, uh, some video on the internet like some bureaucrat takes bribe, bribe, uh, bribe. and this uh, video is downloaded 100 times and is dangerous for this bureaucrat. What does she do? Uh, what does he do? He buys some internet company that starts automatic download 100 million times, then I go bankrupt. That is, that is a really crazy idea. If an internet provider uh, gives me some 10 megabyte of space or 10 gigabyte of space and the users pay for having high speed lines, then th uh, that's, that's all. If governments come and say, well, they need to pay, they need to pay, we need deed package inspection, we need to control what is going across our borders, what is told on Skype, what is written in Gmail, that is really a very, very, very bad way. No one will be a winner except of dictators. Philip Holtman, is there a good way out there to make sure that the information infrastructure that we need for the Internet to be secure, to be safe, to be sound and modern, can be ensured in the future with the kind of increases in volume that we're looking for? What, what kind of regime do we need for that? I think we would need a participative leadership approach to the Internet where uh, um, different actors from different fields, business and political sectors, civil society sectors, but also subcultural groups could come together in a body such as I can. Well, this is very, it's an utopia I'm speaking about, but it would be very nice putting a body such as I can, I can to um, and a neutral country and enabling uh, lots of different interest groups just to formulate ideas how to make the internet more uh, trustful and more um, participative for everybody. Of course you can't bring everyone into the boat but the more representatives from the more diverse cultural, political, social, economic backgrounds you have in such a body um, notwithstanding that you, of course, have to regulate uh, the representative powers of such people because an uh, economy opinion leader will um, claim to have much more vote in such a body than a simple uh, civil society leader, but this is not the way it's going to go. We would have to have a body which is really uh, um, uh, putting the uh, influence of opinion on equal footing, equal terms. I could Im imagine something like that, but uh, then in general terms to create um, a safe, secure internet is again going to the direction of the security debate and as humans we know that uh, we are born and we will die and there is no security in this life or in this world and security is a halo. So what we can, um, what we can strengthen is a mutual trust, I think, that's more important than security. Marcus Beckertal, 
a very stirring exposition there of what an ideal system might look like. What kind of system do you think will emerge from these meetings? They end on the 15th of December. They will theoretically come up with some draft agreement that would then be circulated for signature, ratification, a very lengthy process. What do you expect to come out of it all? I'm optimistic um, that there will be no outcome in this conference because we have two big blocks, the Western world and the repressive regimes who have, um, there will be no compromise in this um, conference. So we might have some agreements that say uh, agree to debate in the uh, next years um, on the same level and um, to do some more conferences. But um, what we see now is the start of a chess game on the global level around the issues of internet governance and who controls the internet. And it will be a very long chess game, maybe over the next five or 10 years, maybe we will find a solution, maybe not. But I totally agree with Philip. We need more multi-stakeholder approaches on the national level, uh, as well on European level and international level to find solutions which fits into a 21st century, which are open and participate but the chess game metaphor is also one of the best ideas I think I've heard so far because I think this is absolutely true. It's a very strategic chess game around the control and governance of the internet that is uh, just about to start to take uh, place right now. At the end we'll have one free internet that is international and 100, maybe 50 blocked, isolated, unfree nets. That's, that's another scenario, very possible, right? Even if that were to happen, won't many of the people living in the countries with those blocked, unfree national nets still somehow find access to that other big free one? Certainly we've seen that in Syria, in many with other some countries. some technical skills, yes, but that will be complicated and expensive. Even in uh, unfree countries like China or maybe Kazakhstan, where most international block platforms are blocked, some clever people get access to those blocks, but that is expensive, complicated, and that can put you in jail. So possibly a two-class system in the future. I'd like to thank all of you very much for being with us here today, for joining us, and all of you out there for tuning in. See you soon. Bye-bye.